Hello, welcome to Worship at Westminster. We're really glad you're here. Well, I got this beautiful picture. I'm going to show it to you. From one of our Westminster community friends with a note on the back that I thought was just beautiful. And she says, We are all flowers from one garden. Remember that your kindness, smile, and light keeps the whole world cheerful, awake, and aware. And I thought that was such a great thing to think about. All of us are blooming, hopefully in our own places, spreading beauty in our own places, which we wish was all here in this big garden at this, at this building. But we, the church, are spread out everywhere at the moment, um, spreading God's love and beauty. So I just thought that was wonderful. I actually will try to include some pictures of the flowers um, around our church campus that, that I've taken over the last months just to kind of inspire us all to continue to be beautiful. All right, well, let's turn our hearts and minds toward the worship of Almighty God. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's join together for our first hymn.
Even before a word is on our tongues, God knows it and welcomes our honest confession and true repentance with forgiveness and the promise of new life. Let us then, with the confidence of the children of God, confess our sin to God. Gracious God, we come before you seeking forgiveness. We confess that at times we more often speak about justice rather than do justice, that we sometimes cling to self-interest and small-mindedness rather than to love, kindness, and compassion. We confess that we are not always as we seem to others, nor even as we tend to be to ourselves. We come to you knowing that our lives are far more comfortable than others in the world, and that we still complain. But we also come knowing that you are full of forgiveness when we are not, that you show us love even when we neglect to show love to others, or even to ourselves. May this confession free us to become more loving, more aware, more like Him, in whose name we pray, Jesus Christ. Friends, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. We need not fear God's judgment, but rather rejoice in the Lord's saving grace that frees and transforms us. Sisters and brothers, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Testament lesson for today comes from the book of Genesis. We have chapter 45 and then later chapter 50. So the first part is chapter 45 verses 1 through 15. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth 
and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that this it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring back my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. While Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. And the second part of our story is the great forgiveness at the end of the story of Joseph. This is Genesis chapter 50, verses 14 through 21. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intend to do me harm, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Good morning and welcome to Time with the Children. Lila and Jack and I are here in our kitchen having a little snack and we wanted to talk to you about a word we've been learning this week and that word is peace. So the other day, kitchen, we had a really loud and fun day and um, we were playing with lots of loud toys. And then I said, Mama needs a little bit of peace and quiet. And Lila said, what is peace? What does that mean? And so I went to our bookshelf and I found this really fun book that we have about the word peace. So I thought we could read it to you guys today. It's called Peas on Earth. So let's read that together. Peas on Earth. What if there really was peas on earth? Not just two peas in a pod like us, but peas everywhere. What do you mean? A world filled with love and peace where everyone and everything got along. That sounds peaceful. Peas on earth is when everyone is best friends like peanut butter and jelly, milk and cookies, and salt and pepper. And don't forget, best friends share. Sharing is caring, right, and no biting or fighting. But pillow fights are okay. Tickle, tickle. Peas on earth is when dogs get along with cats, and cats get along with mice, and mice share their cheese with elephants, and pigs give everyone piggyback rides. It's when giraffes help turtles reach the tippy top of trees, and ants say bless you when ant eaters sneeze. And everyone says thank you and please. Don't you mean peas? It's when fruits and vegetables taste just like candy, like apple pie and carrot cake. 
It's when we can play all day, and it only rains when we're sleeping, and we can make snowmen that never melt. When everyone is nice and nobody is mean, when the air is clear and our water is clean, when the skies are blue and the trees are always green. Peas on earth seems pretty perfect. Yeah, let there be peas. Give peas a chance. Woohoo! Give peas a chance. The end. That is a fun and silly book about peace, but I think it does a great job of explaining the concept to young kids. Peace just means being kind and taking care of one another. So the, another book that talks a lot about peace is the Bible. And one verse that we found that we liked was, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. So it's our job as kids and grown-ups to spread peace on earth. So I hope you can find some ways, maybe when you're playing with your friends or your brothers and sisters, or speaking to your parents, or just meeting a stranger, to spread a little bit of peace and kindness in the world. Okay? Let's say a blessing. You ready? Good girl. All right, close your eyes. Dear God, thank you for the gift of peace. Help us be peaceful people in the world. Amen. 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 Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Our New Testament readings for today come from Romans chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, and then 29 through 32. I ask then, did God reject his own people? Certainly not. I myself am, am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people, whom he chose from the beginning. You know what the scripture says in the passage where Elijah pleads with God against Israel. For God does not change his mind about whom he chooses and blesses. As for you Gentiles, you disobeyed God in the past, but now you have received God's mercy because the Jews were disobedient. In the same way, because of the mercy that you have received, the Jews now disobey God in order that they also may now receive God's mercy. For God has made all people prisoners of disobedience so that he might show mercy to them all.
Our gospel lesson for today is Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. Jesus left the place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, welcome back to a, another episode of Conversations with Buren and Barbara. Uh, actually, we're going to have to do that again when we have that kind of dialogue conversation. Uh, <clears throat> but for today, when I was in seminary in Louisville, uh, rather close to us was the large Southern Baptist Seminary. And if you were enrolled at the Presbyterian Seminary, you could use all the facilities at the Baptist Seminary. And they had you know, swimming pools, tennis courts, and gymnasiums and stuff, and so uh, we would go over there quite a bit. <clears throat> they had some basketball leagues, uh, I don't know, three leagues, and a lot of teams in each league, all just from their school. So we put together a team. We managed to scrape together about seven or eight guys. We called ourselves the Frozen Chosen, and we went and joined their basketball league. And I know the Apostle Paul says, you know, we're th- we shouldn't boast, but I just uh, we did win the league <laughs> championship. Uh, inevitably, when we were getting ready to tip off, this would happen. For some reason, it happened to me. But we getting ready for tip off, and some, one of these kids would turn to me and say, "So, are you guys predestined to win?" And I always had the same response. I said, "Well, I'll tell you right after the game." And If we won, and we did a lot because we won the championship that year, uh, I try to find that person and just go up to them and say, yes, and smile like that. I mean, it was all in good-natured fun, right? But I say that to say something about predestination and then providence in general is that, you know, predestination has nothing to do with this was supposed to happen at this particular time, so forth and so on. That... Predestination is about our salvation, our, our destination, and humanity's movement toward, toward God's shalom, or what the New Testament calls the kingdom of God. But also about providence is that it really is, I think, something best understood looking backward at one's life, uh, <clears throat> at the things that have happened, good or bad, that have shaped us and made us who we are today, and, 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 and somehow knowing God was there in all of that. Not for me that God caused all of these things to happen, either, again, good or bad. And it's not like we're, you know, puppets being strings, you know, pulling us, maneuvering our lives and events, but that in all these things that happen, none of it occurred outside of God's love and goodness and, and care for creation and for all of us and or happened outside of God's concern for justice in the world even when it doesn't seem like it in our, in our present. And I think faith, part of faith is coming to, coming to trust that and then living as if that's a reality because then that helps shape the world that we, that we live in. Uh, providence is a theme throughout, well, I would argue throughout the Bible, certainly throughout the book of Genesis. You know, all of these things happen, you know, and it doesn't seem like God's anywhere in the picture, and then, you know, they unfold somehow. Uh, certainly the Joseph story is, 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 it is about providence, and 
Today, the story that the passage that Barbara read, we get the big reveal, right? All the why all of this happened. Here's Joseph, and you know the story. He's sold into slavery by his brothers, and these horrible things happen to him. But also by chance, by chance, by coincidence, he becomes one of the most powerful men in Egypt. When it just so happens that his own people are having a famine in the land and have to send his brothers who sold him into slavery to Egypt to find resources. And who is the secretary of agriculture but their younger brother Joseph? And rather than revenge, uh, this magnanimous figure utters this great line, which sometimes I think the whole book of Genesis was written just to get to this line, you know. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. And that kind of goes to the heart of his life and to the sort of the heart of providence. So in all of this, somehow God was providing. Uh, and there are lots of ways to look at that. You know, there are some who would look at each part and, you know, God did this and did this and then did this and did this. <clears throat> I look at it in a broader way that, again, in all of these things, even misdirections and wrong turns that, that it was never outside of God's care and concern. You know, there's a, there's a line in Romans in chapter 8, I think, where there's a dispute in translation. One tra some translations say, you know, all things work for good to them that love the Lord. And a few translations, which I personally think is closer to the Greek, say, in all things, God works for good. And that's not just semantics. It really is, a, I, I think, a different theological slant. It's like God's not responsible for all the, the, the things that happen, but that in everything that happens, God is working for good, and that God's Spirit is, 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 is purposely pushing toward the good. Uh, and so Joseph, this figure, looks at his life and sees that in all of these things that happened, God brought something good out of that. You know, here I am now in a position to help my people. And so for many of us, you know, we look back on our life and we see blessings and just unimaginable graces. And there have been tragedies and there have been losses and, and just, you know, people have seen horrific things. And again, for me, it's not that God caused these things to happen. It's that, you know, I know in my own life, in the midst of something, there was people there. There was a community there to support me. In different ways, I felt love and grace and goodness. And for me, therein lies the provision. It's, it's not the things happening at the um, um, at a point in time. It is that that sense that as dark as it may have been on this circumstance or whatever, that God's love was never beyond my experiencing. Uh, and again, there are some things you look at and say, you know, to, to look at the Holocaust and say, well, something good may have come out of that. It's just it's just trivial to me to even to to say that or think that. Uh, but love wasn't ultimately defeated. Goodness was not ultimately defeated. Uh, and so perhaps moving forward then, if anything, it teaches you to, you know, to be grateful for the blessings, but also to, to remember in those other times that we are never outside of that pervasive, you know, pervasive influence of, of, of God's goodness. Uh, and what's interesting is that if Joseph were only an individual, and this was a historical account, I, I don't know, the, 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 the whole what you meant for evil, God meant for good, it, it sounds almost too magnanimous. You know, all of this stuff that he goes through, these years of tragedy and suffering, and, and it's like, oh, you guys, come over here, you rascals. It's like... <laughs> I don't know about that. But imagine this centuries later, right? Here's a people that have gone through, maybe going through this national 
trauma, the fear and anxiety. They're just filled with despair at all the devastation that they've seen around them and, and you know, just struggling for any little bit of hope for the future. And how they might have been feeling because of those who had foisted this upon them. And then to be reminded of this story, this is part of our faith. First, you can't, you can't let that revenge, that, that hatred, that anger, you just can't let it eat away at you because it will. And maybe they also heard that it may not seem like it, but God is providing now right now in ways, mysterious ways that we can't understand that provision is working somehow. Just like if you had told Joseph in the midst of any of these things, well, God's working in your life. Where? <laughs> you know, not now. I don't see it. So that for this people centuries later, this story is God's working somehow mysteriously now. That love is working uh, in your life. God's love and justice has not left us. I don't know if it's helpful. It is for me. It may not be helpful. I, I wonder, before GPS came along, I wonder how I ever got anywhere. I know I went places. I just, I don't know. I can't honestly remember how I got. I've become so dependent on, you know, the GPS to just. But if you make a wrong turn, or if you think you know better than GPS, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, you get that rerouting, rerouting, rerouting. Uh, and I think of God's providence kind of like that. The destination is, the destination is justice. It's, it's the kingdom of God. It's shalom. It's that place that we celebrate at communion. It's that place that the biblical prophets talked about. That's the destination. The kingdom of God and sometimes we make wrong turns, and sometimes things happen that we're, we're off the route. And the mystery is, is this the route or are we being rerouted? And we don't always know that. Uh, but I think the Joseph story is one of those parts of our faith that says, even in the midst of a horrible reroute, we're, we're still not outside that love and justice and care. Uh, and to be open to that helps us to see things differently, I think, spiritually and theologically. Paul's a good example of this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this passage, but I, I think the Romans passage that Barbara read, uh, Paul summing up his argument about, uh, you know, there, there were those who believed that because the Jewish faith at the time had rejected Jesus as the Messiah, that somehow God had rejected them. Uh, ironically and horribly, a position that still seems to be among us, among some segments of Christianity, you know, that, that somehow they are out and we are in. And Paul very explicitly says, no. I don't know <laughs> how I can say it any more emphatically. No, that's not the case. God has not rejected the Jewish people. He says, he says that rejection was a way for God to open up the faith to include the <laughs> to include the Gentiles. Uh, kind of a God taking something <laughs> intended one way and using it another. And that's how Paul looks at it. And he says, we have been adopted into this family. We always want to draw in. And biblical faith always seems to be pushing us out, pushing us out of ourselves, pushing us out of our religion, pushing us out of our belief system, pushing us out of our biases and prejudices. And again, if we stay open to that, then we're more open to those places where maybe we're being rerouted spiritually or theologically, which is transition, which is what the story of the Canaanite woman to me, it's one of those it's one of those rerouting times. And it begins with Jesus himself. Uh, this is a provocative story, uh, the king of that woman story. You know, this is a woman, uh, this is a woman who's poor, she's a foreigner. 
you know, Canaanites and Israelites. I mean, there's a long history of antagonism there. The fact that she's out there pleading for mercy for her child, even speaking to these Jewish men walking by, implies strongly that she's a single mother for whatever reason. You know, so this is, this is a story, a provocative story, someone on the margins. It's a challenging story for ministers because what do you do with the fact that Jesus responds to this woman with what would have been considered a, a racial ethnic slur? And there's just no way around that. Help me, Lord. Have mercy on my child. And at first, he says nothing. Silence. She persists. Finally, he says, well, you know, the line is not fair to take bread meant for children, and give it to dogs. Some have said he meant, well, you know, the puppies that hang around the table, and, you know, it's like calling her a puppy, or I don't, I don't know how that interpretation goes, but that's not right. Uh, some have said Jesus was having a bad day, you know, short-tempered, you know. Uh, one interpretation, that it, Jesus was testing her to see if she would stand up for herself. This doesn't ring true to me. Here's what rings true to me. Is that Jesus, fully human, fully divine, all right? Fully human was a first century Palestinian Jewish man, born into a world that had boundaries, that had, you know, cultural boundaries, religious boundaries, and some of those boundaries, some of those prejudices and biases were ingrained. It's what you would expect from anyone. What do psychologists call that? Internalized prejudice. So ingrained, we don't think we have it. It's almost taken for granted. His response would have been the response of any man. And in fact, the disciples are like, just send her away, you know. But he stops and he listens to her finally in, the, in her persistence. And to me, that's the beauty, that's the beauty of, our, of that story. Even our Lord recognized that sort of in himself and as part of his heritage, as part of his upbringing, you know, whatever. And I would say that's what makes him perfect. Not perfect in the sense he never had a negative thought, he never said an unkind, you know, not that kind of Victorian ideal perfection. He perfectly fulfilled God's will for his life, and, and that perfection involved growing and learning about oneself, about his faith, about the religion he, he was brought up in, and actually trying to recover the, be the, 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 the better parts of that religion. And it involved listening, listening to this Canaanite woman because she is tenacious and she is persistent. Uh, she has said, I will, not, <laughs> I will not be silent and you'll not be silent. And she, you know, she keeps, she, what was that? Uh, oh, I've got it right here. The wonderful quote by uh, recently, uh, deceased uh, Congressman John Lewis, uh, talking about the struggle of the fight for civil rights and talking about good trouble. And he says, do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. This lady is, she's good trouble, you know. She won't be silenced. You can be dismissive, call me a dog, I've been called worse. But she is the voices of all those who won't be silenced. All those, all those voices crying out for just some crumbs of grace, uh, some crumbs of human decency to fall from the table. Now you're saying, Brown, Brother Buren, what does that her story have to do with predestination and providence. It's part of God's rerouting. You know, I mean, in one sense, I think for Matthew, historically, it rerouted Jesus' mission, right? 
well, I came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. No, it's bigger than that. And so it, it was rerouting. And our Lord reminding us that, you know, episodes like this, I think, kept this faith from becoming just a narrow little sectarian cult and into, into a larger movement for God's grace. Uh, less concerned about who's in and who's out and more being rerouted toward the kingdom of God and toward justice. Uh, but part of that provision, part of that rerouting is, is looking, looking at our own biases and prejudices as, as a community, as a faith tradition, as a, as a religion. We always have to do that. And then, you know, listening to those voices, those, the voices of, of all the Canaanite women, uh, and not keeping silent on our part. I said last week I would solve the mystery of predestination this week. Ah, that was a hook. Not going to happen. It is a mystery. There's, a, there's always a tension there between what, you know, what God is doing and not doing. And who makes that call, right? And how do you put your finger on what God may be doing or not doing at any given time? I guess at some point one gets comfortable with mystery. Uh, it is enough for some of us that to hold on to that notion that love and goodness and justice cannot be extinguished and, it's, uh, and cannot be silenced ultimately. And that's what gives hope in dark times and turbulent times. And also, I, for myself personally, I tend to look Christologically at, at providence, I guess. You know, what is God doing, not doing? What did Christ do? What is Christ doing? Providing food for the hungry, providing water for the thirsty, providing hope for the hopeless, uh, and not remaining silent in the face of injustice. Because I think Christ teaches us that God is always providing for God's people, but God's people like God's love, is an ever-widening circle uh, that challenges us to always make some, some Christ-like good trouble. Hallelujah and amen. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father, in sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus is proclaiming the reign of God, forgiving sinners and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Jesus was crucified, suffering the deaths of the human pain, and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, Everywhere, the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church, in gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Our 
Friends, even in our most uncertain and fragile days, we can take comfort knowing that God is with us wherever we are. God is present with us. Although we find ourselves physically separated, we are united in Christ and connected by the Holy Spirit. In this space and in unity with each other, we share the hopes of our hearts, the questions in our minds, and the ever-present worries that permeate our days and keep us up at night. So let us join together in prayer. Gracious God, much like the Canaanite woman, we kneel before you asking for your mercy. We are adrift in a constantly changing current, and today we ask you for wisdom in the face of ever-growing uncertainties. We remember those among us and those known only to you who are consumed with fear, fear for their livelihoods and perhaps for their very lives. Grant us the resolve to do whatever is required for everyone to have enough to eat, a safe place to live, the ability to get the care they need. As we look to a new school year, we are worried about the ongoing impact of COVID-19. It seems to be a time of no right answers, no clear good choices, and no comprehensive way for parents, educators, and administrators to meet all the needs of students, teachers, staff, and families. We don't want children to fall further behind in learning. We don't want to put caregivers in the position of choosing between going to work or tending their children. We don't want to endanger the health of anyone in our community. We pray for decisions that protect the safety and well-being of everyone. We are all faced with difficult decisions in this confusing time. Grant us an unshakable commitment to each other, especially to the most vulnerable among us. Send your spirit to open our eyes to the new thing you are doing. Send your spirit to open our ears to the voices we need most to hear. Send your spirit to open our hearts to the profound love you have for us so that everything we do in this time of fear, anxiety, and uncertainty reveals your compassion, your kindness, and your mercy. Send your spirit to comfort and direct us as we humbly look to you for guidance and strength. Our hope is in you, Lord. You taught us to pray together, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.